This series of tapes, Inflammation versus Misformation, were recorded from classes given this year by Dr. Malachi Zayun, known to us as the Supreme Grandmaster Naya Malachi Zoduck L, our own Pharaoh, I'm a Nubian Boracatron. And now, listen with an open mind and heart as our Grandmaster explains you with only the truth. Allow your inner light to flow again and stomp out misformation with only the facts. And now, listen to the Supreme Grandmaster, Naya Malachi Zoduck L. <laughs> yes, in the corner. I don't answer questions from the tablets. I have private classes on that. See, my philosophy on the tablets is, I want everybody to study the tablets for at least a year. Because I listened to a brother ask a question, right, today, from up there, and the answer is already in the tablets. The question they ask about Luna is in the tablets. The question they ask about Canon, whether he was born in the ark or out, is in the tablets. All these questions I ask them on the internet, send me the questions uh, about the holy tablets. And all these questions are answers. Every, every one we've gotten so far are in the tablets. It's just the people are open the tablets and they're reading a certain part and they're going, I'm stuck. And then they go and say, well, let me ask you a question. So you will elaborate on that. And I'm like, at least read the manual before you try to put the bicycle together. That way, when you do come to me and ask me questions, you will have covered, covered, covered thoroughly enough that you'll know that there's an error there or type of graph. I can say, well, that's a typographical error. Because y'all do know we have made it public that when we had the uh, Holy Tablets printed, we sent it out to Texas. Because we were trying to get it done before our Savior's Day. And they sabotaged it. They left verses out, changed words around, and they did it purposely, and we're in court suing them about it. But it was done. The follow so we have sat back down, and it's been made public, that I've gone back to the whole Holy Tablets within the last couple of months we're doing it every day, and we're adding in all those errors and shifting things back to place so we can have it printed ourselves again. We're trying to get it out again before Savior's Day. So it's difficult to address that, those kind of points, because you might go to a point, I'll say, oh, that's, that's one of those things they switched around. I have to give you a whole you know, lecture. Sometime I'll download it. We was in the internet this week. Was anybody in there when we was there? This Thursday I was in the internet with everybody and we was addressing the Holy Tablet. I said, okay, I'm going to give you all the benefit of the doubt. I will answer Holy Tablet questions. And I had to go back and show them with you know, all, the other, all the things they were asking me already right there in the book. And I would show the book and they go, they would say, oh, I got it. After months of harboring the lunar problem of the, instead of them realizing there was two moons, they think that was, well, you said Luna broke off from here, and it's, it's right in the tablet six, it tells you. You know what I'm saying? So I said, let me let everybody digest it. And by Savior's Day, we'll start with chapter one, verse one, explaining this holy tablet. But here's the problem. Another book has come through, right? It's as thick as this and more detailed. Dear Father, by the time you get here, you're going to be going to another whole book. This, that's, they're sending information that's been long lost in time to come back. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, there's another book called The Black Book. That's, that, that I started to, if you was on the internet, I, I gave you the chapter and the verse. I started to send the verse to it and I said, whoop. I held it back and I just answered the question. Because I didn't want to put it into the internet so the devils can get out on it. <laughs> you know, until we get it to your hands. So I get to you, don't worry about it. There's nothing that I've been sent here to tell you that they're going to ever be able to prove wrong. Nothing. You know what I'm saying? Nothing. And that's the real deal. <laughs> it's not as difficult as most people think. The first thing we told everybody to do is, as in all historical events, it's time to make an exodus to a certain spot, right? A designated place, whether it was the children of Israel or the Samarians or the Hopis or the Trail of Tears, people who were scattered tribes start gathering in certain areas. It always happens right before a great event. The great event is happening now. If you walk out here tonight when the sun is apparently set and look up, you'll see the three stars moving across the sky. We watched it come over and it's lining up over the pyramids. 
in each, every certain amount of days, every 70, it recycles and goes over. These are ancient prophecies that must take place, but you must gather, they tell you. The souls of the people must gather, because it's that combination of souls that send that energy for the realignment. You follow what I'm saying? So we told people five years ago, when we was up in um, Jazeera Abbott, and everything was very beautiful up there. Anybody was up there? Everything was set. But when they said it's time to go, regardless of the houses and the land and the pools and everything, regardless, we jumped up and we left everything. We left our houses, we left everything, and we came down here and started from scratch. But many of people here or there said, I'm not ready yet. They wasn't ready to rough it with us. You know what I'm saying? They want to come here once it's finished and they walk into a furnished apartment, you know, with a quilt and lay back and say, now I live on Kodesh. But they don't want to do as the children of Yisrael did when they had to go into the wilderness for 40 years and suffer. They don't want to do as the children of Ishmael did and the children of Midian did and the ancient Egyptians did and the Sumerians and the Midianites who left and went over to that land and lived in suffered and scraped and burnt bridges, you see. Because as long as that bridge is behind me, I'm going back across it if something gets tough on this side. But if I burn them bridges, when I get on this side, and I look back, I ain't got but one choice but to make this work. Whether it's raining, snowing, or hell, I got to make this work. And they want to keep these ties. And then come here with me and say, I hope what you're saying is right. When I say, I'm not a hope man. Everything I told you happens. Everything I told you to look for happens. This is not a place where people believe there's crafts. This is a place of people who saw the crafts. That's why we gather here. We're not people who have a doubt of whether or not there's some extraterrestrial involvement. Our doubt was how do we stay religious with the reality that there's extraterrestrial involvement and it's not mentioned in the books we say we believe in. That's where our problem came in. Our problem came into reality, faces, beliefs, and fictions. And as a devout Muslim my whole life, it was very difficult to flip open the Quran and scan and scan and scan and scan and don't see crafts. But I've seen crafts. Ain't no accident all across the country, all out the country, people see the same beings. Some little village in Switzerland that doesn't even have a radio station or a newspaper and people are coming to town and saying little four feet men with big eyes and then over in Australia and in Saudi Arabia where it's a Kaaba and millions of Muslims go make Salat every year over there people are seeing extraterrestrial crafts now down in Gulf Breeze, New Mexico and then they push, uh, what is it, this one place Roswell to take everybody's attention off the reality now they got everybody talking about Roswell and whether or not that's authentic and what about the millions of sightings that are going on today? What about people that are being abducted and coming back and going on hypnosis and telling the same story, describing the same beings, saying they got the same treatment, they got scars on their bodies, probes taken out of their bodies, pictures of crap throughout Mexico, they actually sat back with home cameras. We had one of film last weekend. And just thousands of people in Mexico just took pictures of metallic craft, stuff like this. Not lights zooming across the sky, but you can say, well, that could be this, could be a meteorite, could be this, could be a meteorite. Actual crafts. You understand? And then when you come back as a religious person with religious convictions to Christ, Muhammad, or Buddha, or whatever, and you don't find it in your holy book. And if you go to your reverend or your preacher or your pastor or your imam or your kohan and you ask them about it, they tell you you're crazy because you are a signaled out individual in your church who had the vision, who saw the crowd. The majority of church is so spooked out or so caught up in it, they won't admit it that you look like a nut. And the preacher can turn around and say, well, that kid there is a little strange. He thinks he sees little green men. The concept of the little green men are stamped in your head by the media, by television, by cinemas, by the movies as you call it here in America. 
So that when I say, I saw a little man, they say, you're a little green man, right? <laughs> and I can't continue my story without looking like I'm crazy. You follow me? So we're the people who've had the real experiences. People that know something is getting ready to happen. We're the people that are psychic sensitive. We feel something right in the air. Regardless of whether we were Christians, Rastafarians, Muslims, Jews, Catholics, whatever we were brainwashed into. We took the time to investigate our own feelings and set aside our beliefs. Set aside our religious convictions. We reinvestigated the holy books that we had on our mantelpiece where a reverend sat there and told us what we should think, how we should think it, what each thing means. And we stopped and said, wait a minute, let me ask a question. When I started asking questions that the reverend couldn't address, I became a blasphemer. In Islam, when I turned around and asked simple questions, did Muhammad ride some type of camel creature to heaven or not? And if there is, where, what species is this camel creature? Don't get mad at me. Have the learned men of Islam explain it. That's easier. Don't get mad at me and call me a demon because as a child I may be reading the Quran and see where Buruj. Uh, my hadith actually. Buruj. Buruj. What's Buruj? I'm a kid. What's Buruj? I want to know. So someone said, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well that's blessed. Right? Someone said, Well, this is a uh, creature, a gleaming white creature, the size of a mule, with their ears dragged to the ground, that Muhammad sat on in the night of Isra and made an ascension to a place that didn't exist yet. Masjid al-Aqsa didn't even exist then. And he flew there on a donkey. Listen, for all intensive spiritual purposes, for the mutasawa of the Muslim world, I will accept that he traveled in time and space and saw the Masjid al-Aqsa in the spiritual realm before it was conceived on earth. Right? But all that falls in the realm of belief and faith, not reality and fact. Now, as long as I'm a belief and faithful person, that's a colorful story. But when it comes down to reality, I want to know what species this creature that flies through the sky belongs to. Is it the white horse that I see on the front of the movies and MCM movies? I've seen the white horse with the wings, but I've never seen a white horse that looks like a mule or a donkey in reality in any circus or zoo or log in any of the species of this planet. So where the hell did it come from? And what is it? And I get mad because I ask? I get met with Astaghfirullah, you Catholic, Munafiq. You gotta be, you even become, I even become Shaitan. They go so far as to call you Shaitan himself. So I am the Shaitan? I'm the devil. I was back there arguing with them in Adam's time because I got a question. Y'all niggas are really uptight. Y'all like nine on the tension scale in this way. Well, I'm going to deal with that. I can't even ask you a sensible question before I become the devil. And as we who have been sensitized by forces, that means they made me and you sensitive. They made me and you inquisitive. We had to be walking along the street, minding our own business, and a book gleams off of a table with some brother standing out there with whatever costume. This book catches your eye as you walk by you. And you tell what is this? What is this crap? What do you people believe now? Mella who? Mella what? Mella, Mella what? Who? What is this guy? God, yeah. And when they say he ain't no God, you know what they're doing? They're coming from their interpretation of God. They don't ask you when you say Malachi is God, what is your definition of God? They go right to their church or their mosque and say, Stop it all, I'll say, Moses will be laying in the shape of me. They go mumbling on down the street calling you Shaitan. And they say, well, excuse me, have you ever seen a picture of a pharaoh in Egypt? They go, yeah. Did you know that they were considered gods? Yeah. It's not a black thing. Because Julius Caesar was considered a god. 
You know what I'm saying? That's what we mean. They can't even begin to conceive common sense and logic because they've been washed in faith and belief. You hear me? But people are gathering all over the world that are aware that there's something shady about belief. And that's the word I dwell on every week. And you know why? Like I said many times, because once I can get you to believe something about somebody, I can damn near make you do anything to them. If I can come in here and say, see all these people gathering this in place, this place here? Yeah. They're a cult. They're a cult because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is their personal savior. That makes them a cult. See the guy up there in the front? Yeah, he wants to make everybody commit suicide. Now, why does that work so well in Christianity? Simply because the God of Christianity committed suicide for you. He can readily identify with Jesus willing to give his life for you. So, if you're a Christian, the doctrine of suicide works well with you. And this is why the first thing they say about every group of people that organized in this country who do not belong to a Christian denomination is they're a cult, and then it's followed by a suicide cult. But Christians are the ones who were suicidal because every cult in this country and in Guyana and every other who ever committed suicide on a massive scale were Christians. Because it's in their doctrine to be willing to die for someone else. It's not in our doctrine. You hear me? It is also not in the Pope's doctrine. But that nigga be trying to live. And I don't give it if you get mad. The Pope is trying his best to live. That nigga got a bulletproof Pope mobile. <laughs> you hear me? I want to know. Hell, I, I've been asking this question. I ask this question every week. I want to know if the Pope is God's best friend. Him and God is tight. Why don't he want to go visit God? Why is he trying to teach me that I should want to die and go return to God when the Pope is ducking his ass off? They made him a new Pope mobile when he went to Cuba with a lid on it. See, the old Pope mobile, he could stand up like his hair and do this. Word up. But the new Pope Mobile, he's sitting down doing this. <laughs> now, this true what? If he is so close to God, and I know as good as the Pope is, when he dies, he's got a direct ticket to heaven. He will not pass gold. He don't need the $200. He's going directly to heaven, right? Mother Teresa, with all that beautiful stuff she did, she got a direct ticket to heaven. Mother Teresa had six collapses and pulled through it. And they'll tell you when somebody that age has a collapse and pulled through, they got to want to live. After they'll tell every one of us who had relatives who were old in the hospital that had a seizure, they say, that problem with you, they got to want to live. The family got to give them that desire to live. And Mother Teresa pulled through six of them suckers. She had to really not want to see God. If the Pope is riding around a bulletproof Pope mobile, he don't want to meet God. But he's teaching me to want to go meet God. Billy Graham collapsed four times while giving a lecture. Just went, oh, boom. <laughs> and God didn't catch us either. <laughs> Billy Graham hit the floor in front of thousands of his followers, was on television. No angels came out the sky and grabbed his homeboy, hit the concrete. <laughs> Took him to the hospital, put all kind of tubes in him, pumped him back up. He was back out teaching again. Billy Graham should have woke up, pulled the tubes out, and said, I'm on my way, God. Because <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. And no one gets to the Father but by him. 
On the way down, the Pope was supposed to say, I'm on my way, Jay. <laughs> and they make that sound like blasphemy. He's making fun of the Bible. If the Bible was infallible and factual, I couldn't make fun of it. If what I'm saying doesn't make sense, you wouldn't be laughing. You know why you're laughing? Because it's frightening to think about it. When we start laughing, we might tear into your head. <laughs> My line? Start laughing like that. Your wife gets you mad. <laughs> That's the real deal. That's why when we hear facts, the only thing we can do is laugh. But if we don't laugh, we don't know what we might go out there and start doing to people. You understand what I'm saying? So now, here we come along, and we came a long way. And we the people that say, we don't care whether you're a Christian or a Jew, a Muslim or Buddhist, I don't care. But if you question, you start messing with me, trying to convert me to your religion, I'm going to tell you, as long as you don't bother me, I ain't going to bother you. We can come out here on Kadesh and party together and dance together and have a good time. But if you say, well, let me tell you a story <laughs> about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to say, hold it. I'm going to warn you now. I'm going to do the holy field on you. I'm saying, I'm going to step to you. Don't start the conversation. They didn't know they, they didn't know that they saw me in a story, you know, Dr. Drug, I asked you about your... Your little uh, thing out there, and I say, listen, you don't want this to happen. I don't know who sent you here. Maybe that nigga sitting over there with that grin on his face, but he didn't tell you it was getting ready to happen to you. So I'm gonna be nice and I'm gonna pay for your dinner, because I'm not the man you want to start an argument with. I got a lot of sons and daughters out there that will take you through it gradually. You understand? But you don't want this straight right, I'm gonna hit you with. You understand? Why? You know why? Because when you deal with facts, fact after fact, people can't handle the truth. And they turn around and get mad at you. And I just said, you asked for this. I wasn't bothering you. Come on to Kadesh, walk around the pyramids, pray to whatever you pray to, the way you pray to, and let us do our thing. But if you step over that borderline and step into our business, then we're going to have to clean you up. And we're going to do it with Fact. Now right, give me a bite. There we go. You got one too, huh? He had the Bible, and all you Christians, he had the Bible on the floor. Y'all should be mad at him. <laughs> Get it on the way out there. <laughs> this is why, <laughs> this is why I don't have no time. I'm going over this for y'all because why do y'all use this? I got to use this so each week, take you a little deeper into why this is both. But this is where it all lies. <laughs> you hear me? In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Who's talking? According to Christians, this is God's holy book that he personally wrote with his own finger to Moses. I'm talking about the, at least the five books. Correct? So this should say, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. But it doesn't say I, it says God talking away from himself. So now the question is, who's talking? Let's keep going. And the earth was without form, and void and darkness was upon the face in the deep. Now this person is talking about a formless earth but at the last part, he says, the face of the deep, as you say in Hebrew, feyu moyu, the surface of the deep. The deep is called water, yem, sea, the deep blue sea. Are you with me? Now, you got to stay in the mind frame to get this here, all right? And the earth was without form. The earth is the ground part, erith in Hebrew, the matter part. It had no form, there was no mountains or streams to stand on. And void and Darwin, Boho and Toho, they said, was upon the face of the deep. Check that. Now, where was this person looking from? They had to be looking from one direction to see this. Look what it says. 
And the spirit of God or the Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. So this person was in the deep sea looking up. This is right here in the Bible. He's looking up from beneath the deep blue sea and sees God moving across the water. Now, no angel could be doing this without God's permission. And no Christian Jew or Muslim ever said an angel wrote that book. They say this is written by the Yad or the hand, Yad the Elohim, the hand of God. And they wear on their neck a Jewish symbol like this. And that's the Hebrew letter Yah. Right? For hand. They say his own hand called. Women. So to them, God wrote this Bible. Is that right? They call it the word of. I want you to keep that frame of mind so you can see who's talking to you. It's important. Next verse goes, verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light. This is not God talking. Someone talking about what they heard God say while they were in the deep blue sea watching God move across the water. He heard God from beneath the water say, Let there be And it says, and there was light. He's talking about what God he said. He's sitting there and he saw God and God said something. He said, let there be light. And damn, it was light. And God saw. Now he's watching with God. So God, he had to see God do this. <laughs> Walking. I ain't kidding. And God saw that the light was good. Told. And God divided the light from the darkness. So God first looked at the light and said, and then he said, and divided. Somebody's watching this happen, man. That's what the Bible means. They're looking at this in progress. But, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning was on the he didn't say God did that. He figured that out himself. Look at it again. He didn't say God did that one. He saw the light and day. He said, I the morning. So this person understood the motion of the sun around the planet before the sun was created. Because the only way you can get night, day, and evening, and morning is the so-called motion of the planet around the sun. But there was no sun yet. Now, how did he see that? A vision <laughs> from beneath the water? For six. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. He created a separation in the waters. Check that out. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Come on, Rev. Come on, Imam. That got me. That God made light, separated night, even in dark, and then made two waters. Separate water from water. Where, where? How do you separate water from water? Where? The earth was still without water. They said they never said there was any form to the earth yet. And Muslims believe this because they say they believe in a Torah. They say a Torah is called Allah. It's the word of Allah. Oh yeah, it's been tampered with whenever it doesn't match the Hadith or the Quran. Anytime you talk to them and something don't match, then oh, that's been tampered with. You ain't telling a person who's Hafiz or Quran, I know better. Talk to someone who don't know the language. The king of Khan, as they call it. All right, let's go. Where we at? Eight. And God called the firmament heaven. Stop. And there was evening and morning. Was on the second day. So now, water's up there and water's down here. God divided them. Now what, what what is that? Where does that fit in in your in your in your lifestyle in your at, your normal daily atmosphere? Even in the morning, is there something? Night and day is there? Where's waters up there and waters here? That's ascending waters. You know, Father, mist of water goes up to form clouds and comes down there. They already got they got seasons happening already, and somebody on this point. 
Somebody is watching this. Somebody is writing what God is doing and listening to what God is saying. And it ain't God himself. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. Cloud. And let the dry land appear. Now, that means while all this was taking place, there was no dry land. Water was covering the whole planet. And at this point, dry land appears. So whoever is writing does not walk on dry land. Whoever is writing breathes underwater. Because we then covered somebody observing the creation before there was any place for someone who breathes air to walk. You understand? Somebody is breathing from underwater. Let's see what happens here. Watch the story. And God called the dry land earth. Can I go back a minute? Okay, because God just called the dry land earth in verse 10, correct? However, in verse chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Something wrong here? There was already an earth. It says earth in chapter 1. It says earth in chapter 2. And it was already... I'm not supposed to notice this. I'm supposed to sit up in church and gobble up the bullet and never notice this. And if I question this, then I'm a bad guy. I'm supposed to go on century after century and read this crap. And I'm not supposed to ever get intelligent enough on my own to see if it makes any sense. Now that don't make sense. And I'm going to put my soul in your hands and sit around and pray in the church and wait with you for the judgment day on this, based on this. Not no. Call me anything you want, but you can have this. I don't need this. I don't need I can be bad on my own. <laughs> you know, anyway. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs and yielding seeds and the fruit trees yielding fruits after his kind, his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Again, somebody's monitoring his plant. God's now a gardener, planting a garden. Right? You watching this? And the earth brought forth grass and herbs and yielding seeds after its kind. And there were trees and yielding fruits, whose seeds were in itself after its kind. And God saw that this was good. He had to wait for it to happen to see that it was good. He didn't know ahead of time that it was going to be good. Because God said, let it be light. And then God saw that it was good. He didn't know when he created light it was going to be good. And if he did, he wouldn't have to say that. Am I right? But he's doing an after fact thing. Grass grows. That's good. <laughs> that's what every farmer does. Plant something, if it grows, that's good. If it don't grow, he said, that's bad. Is that right? I ain't playing with the Bible. I'm showing you what it says. Like it or not, I'm your brother. You've been listening to them, them, them other people tell you this for years wrong. <laughs> Let me try to straighten it out for you. And I'm, I'm reading you in English, but I can do this in Hebrew also. All right? Don't let nobody fool you. I ain't coming from this King James. This King James wasn't even a Baptist. <laughs> he was an Anglican. Here you are, a Baptist to my King James Bible. Now go read up on the Anglican church and see what they did to Baptists. Yeah? You know? What was that? Ten? I thought I was further than that. Thank you. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights <laughs> in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. <laughs> I thought he already did that. <laughs> Didn't he just do that? Somebody forgot. But let's go on. Let's go on with our soul here, you know what I mean? And where was that? Where was that now? 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Didn't God just grow something back here? Don't things grow 
seasonally? Is this another mistake? How can you have a season created after you had a season? So God is doing things, looking at them, and naming them the same way I would. I'd make a car, look at it and say, automobile. Mobile. Automobile. <laughs> if I get in the car and I turn the key and it starts up and I drive away, I say, this car is good. <laughs> if it don't move, this car is. The point I'm reaching at, and I could go on, is who is making these statements? Who's doing this? Who's explaining the stories? Who's talking about God? Who's watching God? Who is under the water looking up, monitoring God? No, not the devil. Let me show you, because in Genesis chapter 3, the same person talks about the devil. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now the, ser the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So that ain't the devil. Here's someone talking about the devil now. Over here, there's an identity. It says, check this, and this is also in Genesis uh, chapter 3. should be around 15. Yeah, and I, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. This is what this person heard God say. You hear me? It ain't him doing it. He separates the devil from God, from the woman, from Adam. He goes on and says, um, now listen, check, this is verse 22. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us. Now this person is quoting God. The Bible, this person identified himself not as God earlier, but now in 22 it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good from, to know good from evil. In Genesis chapter 1, he talks about God. In Genesis chapter 2, he talks about Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, he talks about the devil. And in the part where he talks about the devil, he now says, Now. Now. Now he mentioned the devil in Genesis chapter 3. Now the man knows good and What did the man know first then? What did he know first? He knew good. The man knew good, right? Because he learned evil. Are you with me? I mean, this is this. And always remember there's a third person here. Almost a fifth person, in fact. And he goes on to say, now listen to this. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden, talking about God, right, of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims. From the word in Hebrew, carib, to mean next to something, close to him. Cherubims, and with flaming swords. Wait a minute. Man is in a garden, and God planted himself. Some being is talking about this garden and about man being in this garden, and talking about a devil that's also in this garden. And then talks about angels that God put in front of this garden to keep people out of the garden. Again, the question should come up, who is this person or this thing that lived under the water and monitored God and monitored God's word? and heard this discussion between Kessel, the woman, and the devil. So he said here, and the woman, this is Genesis chapter 3 verse 2, and the woman said unto the serpent, now he's standing down and he's like this. No church never told me about somebody standing there. I was told there was a tree, a serpent, and a woman. Nobody told me somebody was standing there going there. But the Bible tells you that. The Bible tells you somebody stand there, listen, it says, and, <laughs> and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of every fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the garden, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, and this is the person heard, God said, who is this 
person take that back to church. And the Muslims have it in the Quran, the same story. Take that back to your Imam and ask him, who's watching the story? It's like the Jesus story. You remember the Jesus story and Judas? What happened to Judas? Something about any one good Christian or ex good Christian. What happened to Judas? He hung himself. Somebody, well, let's, let's just do one story at a time. What, how did the story go? Why? He felt bad. And he went back to the room, threw the money down. Go ahead. No, I have to add it because I don't want everybody here. They can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, supposing he killed himself because he felt guilty because he portrayed Jesus by Yahshua. That's right. And he went and threw the money down and went out and got a rope and he went to a tree and what? Was he alone or was somebody with him? So who wrote that? Who watched it? Do <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? If this is true, who was keeping the record? Somebody was walking and going, shoot down the corner. <laughs> Got the rope. You know what I'm saying? He's looking for the tree. He found the tree. He's tying a rope on the tree. He hung himself. And then they stuck it in your Bible. Ask yourself, go back and read the story and ask yourself, who wrote that? Who wrote the Job story? Where God was there, the devil was there, the angels was there, and Job. And, God, and God, Job was being abused. Now, God was there, the devil was there, the angels were there, all the heavenly hosts, and Job and his family. Who wrote the story? Who was watching Job suffer? Are you hearing me? Who was the person who saw Muhammad go into battle and lose? For the Quran, for the Muslim in here. The Quran speaks directly about Allah, and then it speaks about Muhammad, and then it speaks about Gabriel, anyone who does not love Gabriel or Michael is an enemy of Allah. I thought you said Gabriel brought the Quran Let's try again. If Gabriel brought the angel Gabriel, brought the Quran to Muhammad, how could Gabriel say anybody who's an enemy of Allah, anybody who's an enemy of Gabriel and Michael is an enemy of Allah? He would say, anybody who's an enemy of me and my God. So now, who wrote that book? It didn't come from Allah, because Allah is in the verse. It didn't come from Gabriel, he's in the verse. It didn't come from Michael, he's in the verse. It couldn't come from Muhammad, because he's in the verse. But you don't bother to investigate these types of things. And these are the tricks that are messing our minds up. These are the things that are making us racist. These are the things that are making people blow up World Trade buildings and assassinate people. He's the type of doctor to tell people, I don't like what that Imam Issa is saying, we gotta go kill him. Because the thing is, stop him from talking before he wakes me up. Because we were the fastest growing religion in the world, Islam. And now we're not that fast. We had planned to take the whole world, and now we're not gonna be able to do that. Because some fanatic called Imam Issa became Malachi, and he's kicking us in the butt. With facts. And Christians are mad too. Because I can dance through this book and just about go to any point and read it and just go, when are you going to see that it don't make no sense? And then the ultimate is, please tell me, why is it necessary? Meaning this, why is the Bible or the Quran necessary at all? Someone tell me. Stay up a minute. In the Bible it says all scripture is worthy of proof for the edification of the body. Beautiful. Why is it necessary is the question. That's a beautiful statement. Give them the mic. Why is the Bible necessary at all? It is, it is necessary for the edification of your spirit, soul, and body. Okay. Is there a connection between man, God, and the spirit? Let me go to say before you answer. St. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. It was not anything made, it was made without Him. In Him was the light, and the light was the light of man. Light shines in darkness, darkness comes in the not. It was a man said from God, it was God. I mean, you know, I wrote the Bible. <laughs> I was the one watching. 
<laughs> now, now listen, <laughs> that's a joke. According to this here book, there's a connection between man and God. The spiritus of man and God, there's a connection because God said, I created man and I blew into man of my and man became a living. So man is already spiritually in contact with God at all times. So why does he have to make an external communication when there's already an internal communication? Why is this book or the Quran, why is it necessary at all if every living creature already has a spiritual connection to God, a direct telephone line, not a beeper, that God's personal telephone number and you communicate with God directly at all times. Why is the Bible necessary? Tell me. Somebody try. Oh yeah, <laughs> Where, huh? No, I understand that side of it. I'm speaking to the Christian, the Muslim, or the Jew who believes in the Bible. If you don't believe in it, then please don't answer. But you want to say the same thing I say. I'm asking my brothers and sisters that are enslaved into this crap to give me some logical answer why they are believing this thing. Why is it needed? Listen, why doesn't God do this? And all evil is gone. Don't tell me in due time because God lives beyond time. Time is based around sun, moons, and stars. Why is there evil? Why is there AIDS? Why? Can you talk to me about that? Why is there suffering? Why is there caste? Why is there blindness? Why are there cavities? If you are... That may sound funny. I ain't finished though. When I put the cap on you, see what I'm saying? Why are there cavities if you are in the image in the likeness of God, unless he has cavities. Why are there blood diseases? And unless you can tell me that God can have a blood disease. If not, this book lied. Because it said, I created man in my image and after my likeness. Image, he means he looks like me physically. Likeness, he acts like me. Have you ever had a headache? I don't mean your wife. Have you ever had a headache? Or your husband? Have you ever had a headache? Yes or no? Does God get headaches? According to this Bible? Yes. Does, does God get diarrhea? According to this book? Yes. Now, why do we need him? Why do we need God if God is not doing anything for us. And I'll tell you, you may not feel it, but if you had a relative who was in a plane and it crashed and 200 people died and one lived and it wasn't your relative, you'd be asking why, why God? Why my wife died and th that person lived? Why do incidents like that happen? Why are we in this state of mind? Why are we even at this point in time where we're questioning. You know why? Because it's time to question. And if it doesn't stand up to the questioning, then it's got to go. And it doesn't stand up to the questioning. You hear me? This got to go. Unless you can get up there, and anybody who wants to, who's capable, can get up there and let us ask you some questions. And I'll sit down there. And I want you to open this Bible and I want you to show me, first of all, why does God need a New Testament? Why does he have to use something new? That's like me, I gotta get a new car, because my old car don't work. So why is he getting a New Testament? Shouldn't it be a continuous testament? You hear me? That tells you it's man. New concept, new ideas. Christianity is nowhere near what Jesus practiced. Jesus was an Israelite of the tribe of Judah, a Nazarite, very strict. You hear me? He didn't know nothing about your holy roller, Baptist, seven-day Adventist, spirit chasing, tambourine slapping, 
fried chicken, pork chop, eating, chitlin, sucking, bull crap. He ain't know nothing about that crap. He don't know you, this is stuff you made up because you got a new testament. You started new testifying. And based it on baptism, right? And said baptism removes all sins. Is that what they said? And tell me why Jesus got baptized. If he never had a sin. It's lies. This is all lies. Yeah, you got one? Yeah, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the circumcision of the flesh. Okay. The New Testament is the circumcision of the heart. Okay. Did, did Jesus get, according to the New Testament, did Jesus get circumcised on the eighth day of his penis? Yes. Was that in the New Testament or the Old Testament? N New Testament. You want to start, your, want to start the story again? Because you said the flesh was for the Old Testament and the New Testament is for the heart. But Jesus got circumcised. I'm talking about the. I'm not talking about the different. No, 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 no. No, let me. Yeah. I'm not talking about the, the the first part of the Bible and the second part of the Bible. I'm talking about the covenant. Okay. The Abrahamic covenant versus the blood covenant. Okay. Not but, versus, but and the blood covenant. But the, the both of them together. The word covenant in the Bible is brith milah, mit brith milah, and it comes from the word to cut something. Zahaba, where they cut the foreskin with a straight knife in six inches. You follow? This custom was not an Abrahamic custom because Abraham had no customs of his own. Abraham was a Chaldean. He lived in Or of Chaldea and lived under Babylonian customs, as did all the other Israelites when they were taken into bondage by Nebuchadnezzar. They learned circumcision from the Babylonians who got it from the Sumerians. You follow what I'm saying? So there is no covenant of circumcision, flesh or heart that was not taken from the Babylonian traditions. And the God that ruled them is the sixth God in the Jewish calendar and that is the sixth month of the Jewish calendar, Tammuz. And that's in the Bible. And they tell you in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, that the women of Israel sat in the house of Jehovah and cried for the God Tammuz. And they, the Christians cannot explain why they were crying to a Babylonian God. It tells you in the Bible that all the children of Israel turned away and worshipped the, the God Baal, Baal Hadad, a Babylonian God. And they can't tell you why they did it. They can't explain these things. Yes, brother. Robert, um, can you tell us that it was speaking under the water? Say that again? It tell us it was speaking under the water. Right. It, it was under the water. It was speaking. Oh, who was speaking under the water? Yeah, okay, I, everybody who stepped on my lips when I was talking a little while ago and had to quiet them up, that was the reptilians who resided on this planet long before the Big Bang. You know why they call it a Big Bang? It's because something crashed into the planet and split it in half. This is log in the Sumerian tablets called the Atrahasis and the Enuma Elish. They recorded these things before the Bible was even recorded, and they had the whole seven days broken down in the Kuniform, which is a script, wedge script, about an event that took place. Well, beings were living on this planet beneath the water, who you mix in with, and this is why when you're born, you're in a sack of water before you come on to dry land. And that's why you, can, you have gills before you develop your lungs. And that's why when you open your hands like this, you have webs here. And that's why the men can flex here, and women too, but they're the smaller, and we have wings. And that's why our face is set up so we are aerodynamic when we're laying this way, not moving this way. Our lines and our face with the eyebrows and hair, we move through water. Today, if you don't put no Nazima or some baby oil on your head. <laughs> you know it's true. You call it ashiness, but you can scrape that ash off, and it's a form of scales. You follow what I'm saying? These were beings that mixed in with you a long time ago. You were a reptilian. That's why you have these webs. And these beings dwell here on, on beneath the surface 
of this uh, planet before there was any dry land here, millions of years before. And I'm going to tell you, one of the biggest mistakes I always say about this Bible is the word gold. It's a big mistake they made when they say in Genesis, and the gold of that land was good, and the planet was just created. Here, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day which the Lord God made, have made the earth and the heaven. This book declares the generations when the earth was made. You go down, it says, in, in Ethiopia, where the gold, it says in verse 12, and the gold of that land is good. It takes gold millions and millions of years to process itself beneath the ground. Now, how could God have just created the planet and then they find gold somewhere? The planet would have to have been in existence for millions of years. Millions of years for them to, for gold to form itself. There's a mistake here. No. Where the people from Nod come from? Who was Cain afraid of when he told God, the punishment is too great for me to bear. Anyone who catches me is going to kill me. And God knew people lived out there because God said, don't worry about it. Because anybody that does anything, I'm, I'm going to put a sevenfold curse on them. Is that right? Okay? So now, if that's true, then God knew that there were other people out there that could kill Cain. Is that right? And Cain went to the land of Nod and got a wife. Is that right? Now, if the Bible says the only people on the planet is Adam, Eve, and Cain, and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, where did the wife come from? Who are these people that Cain's afraid of is going to kill him? There are people on the planet way before Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is a breed. The word Adama comes from the word blood and earth. That is a clock, a genetic experiment. Something that now your scientists have, are starting to admit since they have retrieved certain crafts out of Gulf Breed, New Mexico, now they're cloning. Something that's been mentioned thousands of years ago in the Enomai Elish, the cloning of human beings by beings who came to this planet from the Sirius Star constellation. And the Egyptians logged it, and the Sumerians logged it, and the Navajo logged it, and the Shoshone logged it, and all these people logged it. But you got a Judaic doctrine watered down into a New Testament, and they cut you off from that information. The only part they gave you was that a ship is going to come get you one day. And that's in Revelation 21. That's the only part. They didn't tell you nothing else. They mentioned in here, in Genesis chapter 6, I ain't going to go through it, about God's coming to earth and having sex with men. I, with the daughters of men. I explained that to y'all. Giants were here. And if Adam and Eve wasn't giants, and Adam and Eve was in the image and after the likeness of God, then who were these giants in the image and after the likeness of in Genesis chapter 6? Who were they images? Your father. And they were able to have sex with Adam and Eve's seed. In order to have sex with them and conceive, what does that mean? They had to have the same genetic structure. Then now who were they? They were giants. They came to earth, called the sons of God, and took the daughters of men and gave birth to children. They took Adam and Eve's kids. Who were they? They called them Nephilians. The word Nephilim means to come down to earth. You hear me? Why ain't these things being made clear to you? So you'll be prepared for the things that's happening now when the stars are lining up and no teacher or no astronomer and nobody taught you in school about no alignment. They didn't even mention it to you on the news until a week before it happened. And they say, oh, the planets are lining up now. Hell bop. How come they can trace out Helios Comet? They've been doing it since the Roman days, but hell bop they didn't know. Hell bop pops up, and not only did hell bop pop up, but something popped up behind it four times the size of Earth. We all read the article, didn't we? And it sent thinking intelligent ways. They said, it's sending messages to us. They said, it's coming to get somebody. Remember that? That was on the news. How they managed to let you hush that up. 
by letting some crazy Amorites go off and kill themselves and make you feel guilty if you bring it up. Oh, you going to the Heaven's Gate call, huh? Psychological warfare. So me and you can't bring it up without feeling guilty. If I bring it up, they say, hell, my, oh, you one of those. You want to commit suicide. Big calm. Welcome back.